All right. So today we are taking a deep dive into a book that, well, I'm sure you've heard of it. Men are from Mars. Women are from Venus. Oh, yeah. John Gray. It's a classic. It's a classic. And uh, we are going to kind of get past just the catchy title and really get into some of the advice and some of the meat of the book. Really some of the things that might help you uh, in your relationships. Yeah. I think one of the things that's so interesting about this book is that it was published quite a while ago. Yeah. But it's still incredibly relevant. I mean, these core ideas that men and women communicate differently, it's it's still so true today. Yeah. The core concept is men and women, we are different. Mm -hmm. And that leads to a lot of misunderstandings, right? Yeah, absolutely. It's like we're speaking different languages sometimes, even though we're using the same words. Yeah. And that's where I guess that Mars and Venus metaphor comes in, right? Right. Exactly. It's yeah. not about saying one is better than the other. It's just recognizing that we approach things differently. Right. Just different. Different planets. Yeah. yeah. So one of the things that really jumped out at me um, was this idea that men are like rubber bands. Oh, yeah. They need to pull away, you know, when they're stressed, they need to go to their cave. It's such a great analogy because you think about it. When a rubber band is stretched too far, it needs to snap back to its original shape. Right. To regain its elasticity. Okay. And men are kind of like that. When they're feeling overwhelmed or stressed, they need some space to just regroup, mm. to recharge before they can come back and be fully present again. Okay, so let's say you're feeling disconnected from your partner. Remember the rubber band analogy. Mm -hmm. Give him the space to retreat and recharge. Exactly. Don't take it personally. It's not about you. He'll likely come back feeling more connected and ready to engage once he's had that time. So it's not a rejection? Not at all. It's just his way of coping. It's how he's wired. It's how he's wired. Yeah, and this ties into the whole men in their caves concept. When men are stressed, they often withdraw to solve problems internally or just to decompress. It's their natural instinct. Okay, so you come home from a tough day at work, and he's instead of wanting to talk about his day, he's like in his man cave reading the newspaper. Right. And you're thinking, talk to me. What's, what's going on? Exactly. And it can be so tempting to try to pull them out of that cave. Right. But, you know, pushing him to talk before he's ready might just backfire. <laughs> It's like trying to pry open a clam, you know, <laughs> it's just going to clamp down tighter. So what's the best approach? What do you what do you do? Well, it's not about ignoring his need for space, but more about creating an environment where he feels safe to come out when he's ready. Let him know you're there for him, but resist the urge to pry or offer unsolicited advice. So just respect his process. Exactly. OK. Now, on the flip side, we have women as waves. Uh, yes. The ebb and flow of emotion. The ebb and flow. So this idea that, you know, women experience these cycles of emotion, it's it's like the tide, right? It goes yeah. up, it goes down. Exactly. And those waves can be powerful. And when those waves are crashing, you know, women often need to express those feelings, to work through them, to feel better. It's not always about finding a solution. It's about processing. So when, when a woman is venting about her day, she's not looking for you to solve the problems of her day. She just needs to, to get it out. Right. It's about riding that wave of emotion and talking helps her navigate it. So so this is where I could see that that's where the clash comes in. Absolutely. Because the guy is like, well, just do this. Why don't you just do this, this, and this? Exactly. His instinct is to jump into problem-solving mode. Right. But what she really needs is empathy, validation, okay. just to feel heard. So instead of saying, well, why don't you try this? Or maybe you should do that. Just say, that sounds really frustrating. Exactly. I can see why you're upset. It's about acknowledging her feelings, not trying to fix them. And, you know, this all kind of leads to another crucial point. Men and women often express and receive love in very different ways. Yeah, it's like we have these different love languages. Absolutely. And we're sending signals, but the receiver is on a different frequency. Right. So what is it that those Martians, what makes them feel loved? Well, men often feel loved through acts of trust, acceptance, and appreciation. You know, it's about feeling competent and respected for who they are and what they do. So not necessarily about grand gestures or constant compliments, but just showing that faith in their abilities. Exactly. Trusting them to handle a situation, acknowledging their efforts, expressing appreciation for their unique strengths. Those little things go a long way. And then for the Venusians? Oh, for women, it's often about feeling cared for, understood, cherished. Okay. You know, feeling safe to express their emotions without judgment, knowing that their partner is there for them through thick and thin. So those small acts of kindness, the listening ear, reassuring words. Exactly. It's about creating that emotional sanctuary where she 
feels seen, heard, and valued for who she is. And I think this is where sometimes couples get into those patterns of feeling unappreciated or misunderstood. Oh, absolutely. It's so common. Yeah. Because they're both trying to speak their love language. Mm hmm But it's not being received. And it leads to those frustrating cycles of resentment and disconnect. Right. But the good news is that once you start to understand these differences, you can actually start to bridge that communication gap. So you can stop having those arguments of, why don't you ever do this? Or you never make me feel that. Exactly. And instead, have more productive conversations about each other's needs and how to better meet them. Right. And it's really being intentional. Yes. Be proactive. Be intentional about expressing love in a way that your partner can actually receive and appreciate and learning to recognize and respond to their love language. Yeah. Even if it's different from your own. Okay. So we've got the rubber band man and we've got the wave woman. Mm -hmm. What happens when those two collide? Well, that's when things can get really interesting because that's when those Martian Venusian differences can really lead to misunderstandings and conflict. So she's having a rough day. The waves are crashing. She needs to vent and he is in his cave. Classic setup for a communication meltdown. Right. He just wants to be left alone. And this is where Gray's insights can be so helpful. Okay. It's not about blaming each other for being difficult or insensitive. Right. It's about understanding those different coping mechanisms and learning to navigate them effectively. So instead of her taking it personally that he's retreated to his cave, maybe she could say something like, hey, I know you need some space right now, but I could really use a hug later when you're ready. That's a great example. She's acknowledging his need for space while also expressing her own need for connection. And maybe he could say, I hear you. I need a few minutes, but I'll come find you when I'm ready to talk. Exactly. He's letting her know he hasn't forgotten about her and that he's willing to be there for her when he's able. So finding that balance. Yes, finding that balance between respecting each other's needs and finding ways to connect despite those differences. And this actually leads to another key point. How do we ask for what we need in a way that our partner can actually understand and respond to? Right, because sometimes it feels like you're speaking a foreign language. Absolutely. And this is where Gray talks about the importance of being assertive in your requests, especially for women. Because we tend to say things like, could you or can you? Exactly. And those literal minded Martians, they might just reply with, yes, I could right. without actually taking action. Right. It's not that they're being intentionally unhelpful. It's just they haven't registered it as a clear request. So instead of could you take out the trash? Say, would you please take out the trash? Much clearer. No room for misinterpretation. Right. But then this is where Gray talks about the grumbles. Uh, yes, the sighs, yeah. the groans, the eye rolls. Yes, and it makes you want to say, fine, I'll do it myself. Exactly. But Gray suggests that we try not to take those grumbles personally. Okay. It's not necessarily a sign of defiance. Right. It's more like that initial resistance to being pulled away from whatever they were focused on. Okay. Think about it like when you're all cozy on the couch and someone asks you to get up and do something. Right. You might grumble a little, but you'll eventually get up and do it. Right. So give them a minute. It's exactly. Be patient. Give them a moment to process the request. And, you know, this leads us to a really fascinating tool that Grace suggests for navigating those emotionally charged conversations. Love letters. Love letters. Yeah. The idea is to put your feelings into writing without blame or accusations just to create a safe space for emotional processing and deeper understanding. It's almost like taking it offline. Exactly. It could be so helpful to get those thoughts and feelings out on paper. Right. Because then you can express yourself more thoughtfully and you avoid those knee-jerk reactions that can escalate conflict. Now, what's interesting is he also suggests writing a response letter. Oh, yes. From your partner's perspective. Ah. Trying to see the situation from their point of view. That's really interesting. It's a powerful way to build empathy and understanding, especially when those Martian-Venusian differences are causing friction. So you're having a dialogue, but it's not heated. Exactly. And you're getting your point across and trying to see it from their perspective. And it can really help to break those cycles of those recurring arguments. You know, those same fight, different day scenarios that leave both partners feeling frustrated and unheard. Right. It's about finding a new way to approach those sensitive topics with more clarity and empathy. And those love letters can provide a structure for expressing those difficult emotions in a way that's less likely to trigger defensiveness or escalate into an argument. So it's a safe space. A safe container for those conversations that might be too tricky to navigate in the heat of the moment. So we've talked about love languages being assertive, and the love letters gray also talks about these seasonal shifts that happen in relationships, or yeah. it's like, like nature, right? It is. It is. It's a great analogy. You go through periods of growth, 
of warmth, of harvest, and even those quiet times of, you know, dormancy. So let's talk about the certains. What What is springtime in a relationship? Well, springtime, that's all about new beginnings. Yeah. Right, that exciting phase when everything feels fresh and effortless. It's the honeymoon period. You're discovering each other. And those differences, they seem intriguing rather than annoying. When their weirdest quirks are adorable. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. But but as with any season, spring eventually transitions into summer. And, and that's when things start to get real. The rose-colored glasses come off and you start to see the flaws a little bit more. Exactly. Maybe those corks aren't so cute anymore. Right, right. It's like the garden of your relationship needs a little more tending now. Yeah. You've got to work a little harder to keep those weeds from taking over. And this is where I think understanding the Martian and Venusian differences is so important. Absolutely. Because if you, if you can understand that his need to go to his cave isn't a personal attack or her need to talk it out isn't about blaming you, it really can help smooth over those rough patches. Yeah, yeah. It's about recognizing that you're both just trying to cope and connect in your own way. Right. And sometimes those ways, they're going to clash. But just like summer gives way to autumn, you know, relationships can, can move into this phase of like harvest and abundance. Mm -hmm. You've weathered the storms, right? You've gotten through that. And now you're you're reaping the benefits of, of putting in the work. Exactly. There's There's a deeper sense of understanding of acceptance. Yeah. You know, you've learned to communicate more effectively, honor those differences, support each other's needs. It's a nice time. It is. It's a beautiful time in a relationship. But then, of course, autumn fades into winter. Yeah. And relationships can go through these periods of, of stillness, introspection. Right. It's it's like the garden goes dormant for a while. It's gathering energy for the next cycle of growth. Right. And, and it's important to remember that this is a natural part of the cycle. Mm. You know, mm -hmm. it doesn't mean that the love is gone. Right. It might just mean that you need a little space to recharge, to reconnect with yourself. Yeah. Maybe do some individual reflection, reassess needs, or, or just take a break from the intensity of, you know, togetherness. Yeah. And... Gray actually encourages couples to embrace this winter phase. Okay. To see it as an opportunity for personal growth, for renewal, rather than, you know, a sign that something's wrong. So it's a journey. It's not a destination. It is a journey. Embrace the seasons, understand the differences, and just keep nurturing the garden. Keep nurturing that garden. Keep communicating. And remember, even when, even when winter's chill sets in, spring is always just around the corner. That's a nice thought. It is. It is. Yeah. It gives us a sense of hope and possibility, even when we're faced with those inevitable relationship challenges. Well, that brings us to the end of our deep dive into men are from Mars, women are from Venus. Hopefully you've gained some insights from this conversation. Yeah. And remember, it's not about blaming each other for those Martian Venusian differences. It's about understanding them and using that knowledge to create stronger, more loving connections. And until next time, keep exploring, keep learning, and keep those conversations flowing.